Hope you guys are doing well. Uh, let me get some of you promoted here. <clears throat> I've got to get the Facebook started. So hang on just a second. We got a, we got a, we got a lot of people sign up tonight. Obviously, it's a great subject. Let's see. So when you get the message, I'm promoting everybody, promoting you to um, panelists. As soon as you get that message, go ahead and uh, open up your video, <clears throat> and then your audio will be automatic. Casey Brown, good to see you, buddy. As soon as uh, Gina comes on. There we are. Can you hear me now? I can. How you doing? Just fine, sir. How are you? We're pretty good. I'm uh, promoting people right now. And uh, Gina will come on. She'll take over that role. And I've got to turn on Facebook. We brought, we, you know, simulcast us on Facebook Live. So, uh, in any case, <laughs> how things in old Kentucky? Man, they're good. They're good. They're hot. Yeah. They're actually beyond hot, to be quite truthful. I think so, you're close to a hang on. Yeah, there you are. Can you see me? I can. You 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 were close to 100 degrees out there today, weren't you? Uh, yeah, not far. I have reached the point in my career where I don't have to be outside a whole lot, so that's mm. definitely good. But yes, 100 degrees, maybe even more um and i'm gonna not change my background just so everybody knows that i am in my throat um okay <laughs> you know i had this uh down for 7 p.m and realized it was 7 p.m eastern time so we're gonna wing it we're gonna go we're gonna teach we're gonna learn we're gonna talk so um don't let the background uh fool you okay no worries let me um Hang on a second. So usually what happens, I get a, a flurry of text right about the time class starts asking different questions like, where's the leak? <laughs> but let me, if you want to, Casey, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn on uh, Facebook Live here. So hang on to your seats. And if any of you uh, have questions, well, first off, I want to welcome all the guests. we got lots of guests on tonight. And uh, we have a special, a special guest. You can see we call him Mr. Cool. His name is P.F. Jimenez from Massachusetts. Oh, P.F., put, put the camera back on you, man. Oh, good. He's at a dog park. <laughs> I never saw you with, with sunglasses before. All right, I'm going to turn on Facebook Live, so hang on to your seats, and I'll be right back. You're, you're muted, P.F. You yeah, can thank hear you. Me. <laughs> there you are. Yep. Yeah. I'm dog sitting, so I had no choice but to be at a dog park. That's okay. That's a good place to make friends. Usually, yeah. Yep. And uh, this, I'm in the my mom's house, guys, back in uh, the mountains. So um, anytime it, you have to load something, it takes a little bit longer. So here it comes. Okay, Casey Brown. Uh. Teaching. Out. Here's the capital for your clients. Okay, let me make sure I get my spelling right. On timeline, go live. Okay, it's getting ready to, to do that now. All right, let me uh, get everybody else promoted here. Let's see, boy, lots of guests. Hi, Gary. Hey there, how you doing? Good, just enjoying the beach over here. Oh, that's right. Oh, so you were on the way to the beach when we spoke earlier. Uh, I went from uh, Half Moon Bay, now I'm at near Santa Cruz. It's warmer here. Oh, yeah. I, bet. I also have on the, the call is David and Sam. So they're Dave. just coming in to learn some from you. Dave Kudo and Sam Ibarra? Dave, Dave and Sam Ibarra. Ibarra, okay. David. Nice to meet you guys. Well, last time I was in Santa Montenegro. Cruz. 
Okay. Actually, I've been in Santa Cruz quite a bit, but uh, not the last time I was here. About five, maybe five or six years ago, up above the town, about a mile, about a mile up coast, is a uh, UC Santa Cruz Marine Biology Facility. Have you ever, have you ever seen it? No. It's awesome. They have dolphin tanks where they rescue dolphins. And I got to take a tour up there, walk around and hang out by the tanks for the dolphins. And uh, it's pretty amazing. They have, they have skeletons of, of whale, whales up there and research facilities. I don't, I'm surprised not that many people know about it, you know? Oh, um, I'd go check it out for about, sure. Oh, yeah. You can drive right up, park, walk around. They have it's, you know, things are kind of cordoned off. But um, I, I was a special guest that day, so I got to go up and, and play with my the brother dolphins, you know? Uh, awesome. I used um, to live in Santa Cruz. That's a yeah. great area. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here. yeah. There's a Matt, statue actually, of Steve a, Wright. Wow. You win. There's a the statue best. of a King Kamehameha up there with a big surfboard. That, that's one of the first places when Hawaiians came to visit America back in the early 1900s. They went up there and that's where they surfed, you know? So, cool. If you guys if you ever wants to surf, it's a great surf spot. Unbelievable. So, I'm scared of sharks. <laughs> well, that's, they're they're up there. Yep. Especially around Half Moon Bay. So, okay, uh, we're going to get started here. Um, there's there's of course there's always people to promote. Um, again, if, if you see the message, you've been promoted. Go ahead and please uh, uh, turn on your video. We like to see everybody here, and I'm glad to see you guys, uh, team members and guests. Um, and go ahead and go ahead and mute yourself if you're not speaking. It'll help uh, uh, clear out all the background noise. And we're going to go ahead and get this started. So we got a great guest tonight, Casey Brown. I met Casey probably two weeks ago when I interviewed him on my podcast. And I thought, I want to have you come teach a class for us. So Casey is also a fellow investor agent, okay? And he has a, another business where he helps his clients raise capital, all right? I'm going to have him ask him to talk a little bit about that. But while we were talking, I realized he, he's an icon agent and he does, he's done quite a number of transactions, a lot with investors, just like we do. And he's in an area that I'm somewhat familiar with. And um, by the way, Kentucky has a lot of great uh, areas to invest in guys. If you're, if you're um, looking for places to deploy your, your assets or your clients, uh, this is definitely one of the places to be. So, so Casey, first off, uh, thanks again for doing this, man. I know you're a very busy guy, and I know how lucky we are to have you on to help us teach tonight. Well, sure. I'm glad to be here, and hopefully we can bring some value to the guests. Um, I'm not, not sure you said you had welcomed uh, some of your team as well as guests, so I'm not, not sure quite what the mix of folks we have in here is, but um, yep. but welcome, and I'm glad to be here to maybe talk a little bit about um, – funds and fundraising and fund of funds and how that uh how that stuff kind of works and and then maybe we can get into it so cool well yeah so we have we have agents on the night from uh multiple brokerage companies for cxp kw uh, remax berkshire hathaway exit it runs the runs the gamut and uh many of us do invest and all of us either work with or looking to learn to, to work with investors, okay? So uh, okay. this was a great crowd for you. But, but one thing, Casey, if you don't mind, um, there's, a, there's an extreme, extremely strong connection here between you and a lot of folks here. And, if, and that's the fact that you, you are an investor agent and you've, you've done quite a number of transactions, like I mentioned. But really pointedly, you mentioned when we were doing the podcast interview, how important it is to build a community around yourself. And I wanted you to touch on that because just a little history. When I, when I was in production 100%, one of my absolute best techniques was to run a, a monthly investor club. I started off in a library with like six people and thought I was a failure. And unfortunately, I had the broker kick in my butt saying, no, you stick with it, you stick with it. And sure enough, you know, three months later, we were, we were up to probably, you know, two dozen people. Five months later, we're 75 people. The librarian said, you got to hit the road, you got too many people, got to find a location, went to a hotel, then it went to 200 people in a year. Now, fast forward, we attempted to do this um, almost two years ago, it, right when the pandemic had started, it was the fall of 2020, and it was in full swing. 
we said, look, we got to do something. We can't just sit back and, and uh, not do something for our, our clients. We decided to try it online and we had some success, but it wasn't anything close to like what it is live in person. So I've been having the thought in my mind, I think this fall, we want to start having some in-person live sessions around the country. And then you mentioned without me prompting you how important it was to build a community around yourself. So would you mind touch it on that just briefly first, and then we can move into the, the capital raising part of it? Sure. Um, let me make sure I'm, un, I'm unmuted. Everybody can hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good. Um, so yes, from being a local agent and trying to find your way and of course i don't is there many is there any beginners in there's no beginner agents in here is there it could be a couple absolutely yeah okay okay um with the thing i got you um <laughs> so the importance of building a community is you know i'm from a town or our entire county has about forty thousand people now i want to I say that to lead to the point that, uh, like Gary said, I am an icon agent, which is, which is pretty high production for such a small community of, of potential clients, I guess you will. And so what we were talking with Gary and I were talking about the other day about building, building a community around yourself and around your business is really kind of, at least where I'm at in small town USA it really is building a connection with the community and, and kind of getting in. So I'll just tell you the way that, the way that I did it. And then you can kind of take this for what it's worth. So the internet and Facebook and social media and so many different places are looking for content. They're like, we all know that we are the content on Facebook and we are the content on Twitter and we are the content on Instagram and so on and so on. And so when I first started looking at what I could do to differentiate myself and where was their content that I could use and just for, for us in the South, and it, maybe it's like this elsewhere, but like, I remember when I was a kid, my grandmother lived for two things. Well, three, if you count us. But she lived for two things. Number one was her coffee in the morning. And number two was the obituaries. She always wanted to know who died. And it was like, it was like that centered the rest. Of, oh, the weather. So I, I guess there's like four or five things maybe that she liked in life. Uh, uh, the weather was one of them. Uh, obituaries was pretty high up there. And so as our local newspapers and as so many other communities around the country, the local newspapers are, of course, dying out because who needs the newspaper when you have everything else? And one thing that I noticed when, as the newspaper was was being led out back uh, to be put out of its misery, was that there was a certain demographic of folks that were missing, specifically the obituaries, because everything else that's content driven takes some type of um you know you have to have an editor and you have to have there's so many other different steps that have to take place the obituaries was something that didn't that was already edited before it showed up it's really unclear as to what the copyright intentions are with obituaries so it's not necessarily plagiarism although it it kind of buffs up against the, that line anyway long story short it really worked well for us so i actually called we've got like six or eight funeral homes in our, in our whole community. And so I called them and I actually got their permission outside of, of just copying and pasting. And I said, if you don't mind, we'd like to get your obituaries, get you to email them to us. And do you mind if we publish them in our Facebook group? Oh, absolutely not. That's perfectly fine. We'd love for people to see whatever, whatever. So basically I started a Facebook group. Now, those of you out there that are familiar with what the difference between a Facebook group is, what a Facebook page is, um, they serve two different purposes. Um, so my real estate page leads my Facebook group. So every obituary that comes through our county here from any of the funeral homes that I've, that I've talked with and subscribed and gotten onto to, to publishing, 
is um, my Facebook has my title, has my Facebook page title above it. And it's, you know, we share condolences, then it gives people a place to go. They're already on Facebook every day. So it's kind of like being at the store and grabbing something anyway while you're there. So these folks started reading this and now we've, we've gotten to where we're about, we've got about, I'm going to say around 20% of our whole community is signed up specifically in my Facebook group. It's a demographic of older folks who are looking to, uh, I don't want to say what the next step is for these older folks, but I think we all know that there's at some point they're going to sell, uh, so on and so on and so on. And so what that, that really just kind of led me to believe that, you know, these communities are so important. Now I take that. And obviously this is, there's investors in here and there's agents that are, uh, agents of, of commercial real estate guys. And so that's a little bit, but I guess I bring all of that to say, you know, build your community around anything, build your community around anything at all. I just didn't have time to write the content that was going to be required to make eight or 10 posts a day and get, and get shares. And, and it just so happened that I slid right in there and was able to get that done. But you know, build it like Gary said, the importance of building a community and having a place where people can connect with you is just ultra important. Um, again, we've got seven or 8,000 followers, I think that I'd have to look, but I've actually got uh, a virtual assistant that takes care of it all for me. Um, and, you know, in that couple dollars an hour that I pay her, she can, she can run um, basically everything. She runs all aspects of our business. Uh, that's, that's the ability to do all over the internet stuff like mailers and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, we just threw the obituary posting and all that stuff kind of right in there on top of it. So it works really good. It's really cost efficient. It's really, it's really a lot of things. Um, and I actually have had folks that now I'm migrating out of the residential, uh, what do you might call it, retail sales side of things or i'm trying to anyway unfortunately my kids still have to eat and that's the um worst part about trying to move into a different aspect of real estate but um i'm trying to move out of that and let my wife take over that part of it but um that's pretty much the community aspect of it and, and it's it's mm -hmm. super important that if you don't do anything else you sit down and you figure out what can i do to 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 leverage facebook groups and and leverage the stuff that's out there already you know yeah well it's interesting you tapped into something that i i honestly have never heard anybody tap into before like like that i mean the fact is you you've actually served a need you know it's kind of interesting yeah. it, you know first it's like wow really they know it, but you realize it is a, it's a niche group it's a community and they do need to be served and if you that's, that's right classic classic business 101 identify a need identify a need and, and uh, serve it <laughs> you absolutely did it and i'm willing to bet you probably had little if any competition you know now uh, yeah I've, I've really had little or no competition and and i tell people about how that works and and how many times it's paid for itself over and over and over and you know virtual assistant um probably do the math for me but she works i think it's two dollars an hour it's 320 320 dollars for 40 hours a week so i think that's two bucks an hour i think that's what the math comes out to be um and she works you know five days a week and 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 they take care of uh, you know everything the other thing that i didn't mention gary that we published in there and of course um so when i first started this I tried to find out what people like people are nosy uh just in general people are just nosy they want to know they want to feel like they're in the know and so we started publishing the deed transfers too um mm -hmm. so my my um virtual assistant will go through our courthouse and of course that's probably a little easier for a smaller community than it is if you were talking you know, you get much bigger than our community, it would be difficult and possibly not even cost effective to do that. But again, it brings it brings back the idea that people can be nosy. I don't care to publish. It's something that's already published out there anyway. 
and you know it just it just again it provides a, a i guess a service if you will um one thing that um you know when when it first started i was getting messages from people like um why are you what is what does obituaries have to do with real estate and you know people being quite ugly and that's how i knew we were really onto something um and that's it's unfortunate that humanity is that way but anytime you start getting resistance and people saying or thinking that maybe it's not appropriate or what are you doing or this that or the other that's typically when you've hit that's typically when you, you you're getting pretty close to figuring something out. Um, everybody kind of safeguards that, but you know, we, we've done it and it's, it's really, again, it's became a, a nice place for people to leave their condolences. You know, we average um, underneath the group post in a, or underneath a post in a group, it'll tell you how many people that it's reached. And, and not that it's not that I look, I certainly would take no reach if there was never another young person to die or, or something like that. I would take no reach at all, but especially when there's a, a death in our community, that's of, of somebody that's young or whether it was an overdose or something like that. I mean, our reach is getting 20 or 30,000 people per post. And again, I don't, that's not, I don't want that to sound like I'm, I'm being vain or being um, like, but but it's just the, the bottom line is is that before now the newspapers were were had their name at the top of it and they were getting whatever you know clippings or whatever people were doing to 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 um to discuss obituaries and now you just kind of unpiece that you know and give it and give it away yeah hey casey uh melanie abraham has a question um she's a, a texan and question is uh how, what what service did you use to find your VA? If you don't mind sharing that. Um, I don't, it's, a uh, online jobs.ph, um, www.online jobs.ph. Um, it took, so as Americans, for some reason, it took me a long time, especially in the South, <laughs> we're conditioned to be leery of just about anybody that's not us um and so when i first met these folks the filipino people are are very um they're just a very wonderful population and i think that there's uh the the girls that work for me are are much like family um i would do just to, uh, you know we we can't send gifts very readily for birthdays and such as that but we try to you know we try we can always pay that money and um the girls can get their kids something or you know whatever we need to do to but uh online jobs.ph the the filipino people have been very 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 wonderful to me um and and have always uh have always met whatever call i've needed um especially my girls now that being said there's a few things that you need to be aware of um you you when you're dealing in folks overseas there is that element that you can't necessarily like put your eye on them um so you don't know somebody might tell you her name is uh whatever sherry uh or something like that and it really be some some bot somewhere so you really got to do your due diligence and make sure that you check in with them but it's online jobs.ph um you can uh you know, you need to put them in your job postings and stuff. You need to put like, uh, if, uh, you know, if you're interested in this job, make sure you put the word, uh, Gary, put the name Gary Wilson in the subject line when they reply, so put that on down in the description so that you know, that's a real human. And because you're going to, you're going to get like a thousand applicants and you have to have a way to weed out at least the people that aren't real. And then you can kind of go from there. Yeah. And, and Melly, we have a, a white paper I wrote, I don't know how many years ago now, maybe 10 years ago. And that actually might be the site I used when I first got TO 14 years ago. And it was like two or three bucks an hour. And after the first year, like, TO, I'm giving you a raise. And he said, how yeah. much? I said, five bucks an hour. And it said, you know, that that's that's like a 60% increase. I said, 
dude, you're worth twice that, you know? And uh, yeah. he's, he's an amazing, amazing person. I, so so um, for Beverly, when you're listening to this, if you could include that white paper on hiring a VA, if you don't have it, let me know. I, I'm, in case I'm speaking to a ghost, she's not on, but she's going to listen to this. Uh, if you can't find it, Beverly, just let me know. I'll, I'll email it to you. We can send it out to, with tomorrow's uh, email. And it's just a, like a description of all the things you go through. And uh, it's, it's a great experience. Um, uh, Andrea Davis on our team has a couple. Uh, Gina has one. Andre, who's not on tonight, he has one. Um, and to me, it's been an amazing experience. And they, to them, to, here's to give, to give an idea. Um, like T.O. give him about $1,000 a month, you know, because he works about 200 hours a month for me. But that's like 50,000 pesos. You know, Filipino, oh, yeah. He's a peso, you know? Yep. And, and they're, they're just, and they're so unbelievably loyal. Yeah. Um, and like, like I, and when I say, when, and I'm dead serious when I say they're like family, I mean, these girls, I, I, I on, in some respects, it could be, a, I don't think it'll ever be a detriment to me as long as we stay together. But, you know, like these girls have passwords to like, like, they get in my Facebook because the other thing, and I, I, I don't know how much Gary, how much we want to, how much time we want to spend on the, the local real estate stuff. But the other thing that we do is like, we, we catalog all my Facebook friends. I cataloged every one of them. I've got almost 5,000 and we cataloged all of them, got their birthdays, um, mm -hmm. send out birthday, you know, every day. And, and the first question that I get a lot of times is, is, well, how does she handle your mailers? And, and she doesn't necessarily handle the specific uh, mailing itself, but what she does is, is she makes sure that the address is up to date, and then she posts in Google. She posts an envelope in Google Drive, where or a, a a string of envelopes for everybody's birthday on a specific day, where all we have to do over here is do the is do the the mind numbing work of just hitting Control P, printing off the envelopes, stuffing and mailing them. Uh, so all the research and everything is done on the back side before we ever get it. So we know that it's right and everything's done and we just got to roll. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Appreciate that. Um, Karen Green's asking, uh, do you embed a page within a page on Facebook? And also, if you would mind, if you could type in that, I know you're on your phone, but if you could type in the chat box, it, I just ask you, is it onlinejobs.ph, all spelled out just like that? That's right, onlinejobs.ph, I believe mm -hmm. that's right. So Karen, I'll put that in there. And if I'm not sure if I understand her question directly, exactly, but she's asking, do you embed a page within a page on Facebook? That, that's her yeah, question. Yeah, I'm not, it's a page within a group. Um, that's probably the best I can, um, that's probably the best that I can come up with is a page within a group. and. Um, so I'm not really sure what she means by a page within a page. Uh, I could need some context or something behind it. There could be something there I'm not getting. Um, but, uh, but it's, it's the page and then you link the page to the group. Um, and you know, you can, you can watch the hundreds or thousands or probably millions of hours of, of gurus tell you, don't hook your Facebook page to a group. Don't do this. Don't do that. And it helps you get just a little bit more reach. And honestly, the way you get reach is, is by just putting the work in. You can, you can not do the things that the gurus tell you to. And any of us that have been in business for any amount of time knows that very, very, very rarely is there an actual shortcut worth taking. Um, so just, just put in the, put in the effort, hook the page up, go, uh, and get everything so that just, just, just get the work and make the investment and roll on. So yeah. it's, um, it's been pretty rewarding for us. Now, again, I, I really can't emphasize enough that, you know, that is, that's a niche that works in our area really well, simply because it's just, it's like, it's, uh, you know, like I said, my grandmother, oh, she, uh, you know, she wanted her coffee and she wanted her obituaries and that's what she wanted. And so we had to step forward and meet that need. But, you know, I know where my mother lives in Colorado Springs, you know, that's not, you know, people just aren't, people aren't quite as, as maybe, I don't want to say nosy, but they're not quite as close as they are in a small town. 
Um, so it's really difficult. Like somebody would have said, hey, so-and-so died that lived up on whatever street. You'd be like, who cares? I didn't know that. You know, you might, but it's just, it's, it, you just have to find what works for your community. Some, some people, um, and that was the struggle that I was coming up with, with, with newsletters is we were in a smaller community. So, you know, there again, for newsletter content, we didn't hardly have anything going on. I mean, you know, you tell about Bubba getting arrested because he was drag racing Saturday night. And other than that, it's like there wasn't anything. So um, we just picked out the high points and, and went with that. So, and again, that's, that's a lot on the, the, the real, the uh, individual real estate sales side. Um, Again, it's just something that, that you can use to connect to your audience. And, and I had a really well-defined avatar for, for my local business, too. So that didn't that helped tremendously. Yeah. Well, well I will give you guys another hint um, or tip on Facebook. Excuse me. You can actually create lists. So on your personal page, if you have a lot of friends, Facebook friends who are fellow Asians, for example, you can create a list of just the people who are agents. And then when you're doing your, your marketing, you're putting a post out there, you can direct it just to the agent list. And you don't have to then send it to everybody, carte blanche, which is what most people do. Then all your other friends who are non-agents and relatives don't have to see all the stuff um, that's about, you know, it's relative to agents. So you can create lists. You can create a list of all your family, a list of just friends, a list of church members, list of coworkers, things like that. Um, and it's a, it's a great feature of Facebook. I didn't even know about it until probably a little over a year ago, you know? Um, so, and Karen, if you want to unmute yourself, if you need more clarity on the page within a page, you can, you can start a dialogue too. If you want to do that, feel free. Um, oh no, um, he, you know what, he, uh, Casey, you answered my question when you said oh. you had a link basically to a group that, that, that clarified everything. Thank you. Yeah. And the other thing that you need to keep in mind too, with these with these girls, and I say these girls, uh, the the VAs is, is you know they're all admins of all my pages, they're all admins of all my groups, um, mm -hmm. uh, personally and through the page, so that uh, we just have some backups within backups. Because if you're if you're as I'm sure most everybody is is familiar with, um, Zuckerberg will smack you every once in a while. And if you get smacked and you don't have things kind of tied up, you don't want to be working for nothing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You don't want to build a Facebook group only to lose it because you didn't have you didn't have something tied up where you could get back into it, I guess, is what I mean. Yep. Um, so, well, I'm going to check for questions here again. But if you want to, okay, so let's go ahead and we got a, we're about halfway through. Let's go ahead and switch gears. Um, and talk We're about gonna talk about the stuff I like talking about now. There you go. This is the yeah. stuff that I like talking about: the real estate, raising capital, and raising capital and, yep. and um, so go. I guess Gary, I'd like for you to maybe start it off with: has do we need to like set some parameters of what I need to cover here? What I need to talk, yeah. talk about? Yeah. Um, let, let's let's do uh, raising capital one on one at least briefly, so people understand what actually is it that we're doing when either we're raising cap capital for our investors or showing them how to do it or essentially creating an environment where you can bring the, the parties together, the people that want to flip a home with the folks that, that are okay providing funding for that or buying a 100 unit building, you do like a syndication, that kind of thing. So a little bit of, little bit of background first um, and then and maybe just go into like a, an example or a case study of, of a project you've been involved in where you help raise capital um, and maybe you were a partner in the project too, because you were the fundraiser, you know? So, yeah. So I, I'm going to, I have a quick gonna, question, Casey, sure. before you get started, yes, are you going, are you going to touch on also, um, bringing people to you versus you advertising out, you know, because of accredited investors and things like that? Um, I, you know, I, and, and like syndications and joint ventures, obviously the way you approach them is different than if somebody's coming to you, right? I'm actually, so, yeah. And so when we start talking about 506B and 506Cs and you start looking at it from, so, so I'm going to, I know how we do it. 
and that's what I'm going to, I'll touch on that as to there's, there's, um, as my grandfather used to say, there's a thousand different ways to skin a cat. And so everybody has their, their own best, best use, their own best way of doing things, their own, their own preferred methods, if you will. My preferred methods basically are 506 C because I, I am marketer all the way through and through. There's nothing about me that doesn't enjoy marketing from every aspect. So the thought that I would actually be involved in something that I could not advertise just almost made me just not even want to do it. Um, not to mention there's, okay. So, so let me back up, let me back up. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. So Gary, on a scale of one to 10, where, well, no, let's do this different. Where do I need to start? Like, do, do, is everybody pretty familiar with a typical syndication and the difference in a 506B and a 506C? I mean, or do I need to go through the basics or what, what do we, what do you think needs to be the, the start yeah. point here? Well, you're, I never you're, heard of it. You've got a mixed crowd here. You've got some folks that have, have never done anything close to it. And others that have definitely been involved. I, I know, if, I know, if, I, Karen and I are actually in the same market, and uh, we knew each other years ago. And some other folks, I can, I can see in their faces, there, they understand the terminology. But I would, I would start with the difference between the two five okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's start with, because, uh, and and if you haven't, if you haven't um, heard of it, don't, don't be upset because or syndication real estate syndication so basically what you're doing is is you're in the private equity business um the private equity business basically means that uh if you have a if you have a, let's say you've got a 100 unit piece of property and or a 100 um 100 unit piece of property yeah and it's a it's 10 million dollars okay and the bank is requiring you to put down 20 percent. so you need two million dollars in cash to put down so basically what you do is, is you put together a syndication, you go out and you call on the people, uh, you call on people to say, hey, I will give you a percentage of my LLC that's going to own this 100 unit complex. I'll give you a percentage of the LLC that's going to own this complex for you to, if you'll contribute, like, let's say $100,000 towards my $2 million need, toward my $2 million down payment. And so what you do is, so now you've gone out and you've found 20 people that will give you $100,000 a piece as an investment. You've given them a percentage of your LLC. Now, the difference that where we get into the weeds a little bit here is, is the stuff is it, now you are falling under the regulation of the SEC, um, Securities Exchange Commission. And the Securities Exchange Commission is, is cool with us doing these things. Uh, they fall under uh, Regulation D of the, S, of the SEC code. And the, and the SEC is perfectly fine with us doing this because these are, not har these are not hardly profitable enough to go through a full IPO process. And they're too profitable and too complex a lot of times for just to just put them out there and say, hey, go do this. So what they tell us is and their guidance says that there's two different types of syndications that fall under regulation i'm trying to make sure i don't get this confused regulation d and and you can go under the 506 c which basically means you can advertise you can put your your need for capital out you can put a billboard in your backyard and get money from anywhere you want to get money from advertised. But the people that invest in the 506C with you have to be what's called an accredited investor. Now, an accredited investor is a lot of, it can be a lot of different things. Without wasting time on that, I encourage you to Google what an accredited investor is. I know there's some net worth uh, minimums, there's some yearly income minimums. Um, and those kinds of things. So basically what they're wanting to make sure is, is that you are financially secure enough. If you were to invest $100,000 with me and that investment went to zero, was absolutely worth nothing after three years, is that your grocery money, basically, is what they're getting at, okay? Now, a 506B is the, is the alternative to a 506C. A 506B 
syndication or capital raise, basically that you can, you don't have to, you cannot advertise it anywhere. It cannot be advertised. It can't be put out anywhere. It can't be, you cannot do any advertising. You can't do anybody. You have to have a prior relationship with the person that's investing and they can invest as little as you, as you want them to. They can invest $5,000 if you want, but you have to have had a prior relationship with them. Now, there always begs the question, well, what consists of a prior relationship? And again, a prior relationship is, you know, the SEC doesn't have a defined, you have to have known somebody this long, or you have to have sent somebody this many emails. A prior relationship is basically saying you have to have a verifiable prior relationship to these folks. So that's why they always tell us to keep emails and stuff if we're going to put people under a 506B to ensure that if the SEC comes knocking, we can prove that we had a relationship with them. Now, these syndications, again, now Gary, I don't want to get too confusing here because I know this stuff can be a lot to bite off. The folks that know what I'm talking about have no problem up to this point, I'm sure. But the folks that, that haven't had prior syndication experience could could get lost pretty quick. But I'm going to move on. Is that good with everybody? Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is where – this is my specialty. And, again, just like the Facebook group, I'm going to tell you the way that we do it. It doesn't mean that it's it's definitely by no stretch the only way to do it. But – with these syndications, you have a very few elements that you as an investor can control. And the first of those elements is, is you have to go out and you have to pick an operator. Now, there is probably as many operators, when I say operators, I'm talking about, you know, like... Um, not property managers, but one step above a property manager. Okay. So if we're talking about an operator, we're talking about the boss of the property managers, which would be uh, the sponsor or the person that's actually doing the syndication, the capital raising, what have you. Now there's probably as many of those people out there as there is grains of salt in my salt shaker at home times a million. Right. So the first challenge that folks were running into is, is okay. I'm getting inundated and there's exactly 1 million operators out there. How do I choose one operator? How do I know that this guy is who he says he is? How do I know that this guy knows what he's doing? What's the past? Just because he says he has past experience, does that necessarily mean that he does? And on and on and on and on and on. And then that begs the next question, okay, we're looking at different asset classes. You've got everything from car washes to self-storage to multifamily to mobile home parks to ATM funds. You've got any, any number of different asset classes that you want to choose um, to pick from. And, and what it does is, <laughs> and what it does is, is it really kind of, again, dilutes the idea of what you're doing and now you're spinning in circles and if that's not enough now you have to stop and say okay where do i want to invest if a hurricane hits florida and i'm in a couple of deals in florida you know you're not going to lose your money because you're going to be insured but the fact of the matter is is you might have to go without a distribution for a certain amount of time because your apartment buildings got blown away or whatever you know what i'm saying so so now you've got geography you've got asset class and you've got um operators and you have to as a beginning investor come in and say hey how do i pick what of these i want to do and so this is this is where the way i do it steps in and what we're we are is what's called a fund of funds and so I guess I needed to give a little definition on a preferred return and a um, distribution. I know I've said that term a time or two. Um, so when we're looking at a preferred return, so when you make an investment into one of these syndications, the preferred return is not guaranteed, 
but the only get the guarantee that you have with a preferred return or the pref as you'll hear as you'll hear it um is that you get paid that percentage before the operator or anybody below you in the capital stack gets paid so for instance our average deal or most of the deals that we're in right now are about an eight percent pref something like that and then of course you you split whatever money is left over on a percentage basis and so what we've done as a fund of funds is is we step in and we go to the operator and say hey if i can go out and raise you two million dollars for your deal will you give me and my investors a preferred treatment which basically means then that the operator says yes so then we go out and we come to 20 different people and we raise two million dollars we go to the operator now the operator is going to pay us a 10 percent pref because he doesn't have to be in the investment management business so he pays us 3,000 capital, my company, a 10% pref on the $2 million. Then he pays that to us and then I pass it back to my investors. And this is just an example, like let's say I pass it back to my investors at nine and a half percent. So my investors have gained a percent and a half by coming to me a fund of funds as opposed to just going to the operator. Now, how that works is, is these operators have, cl have share classes. So class B might, might pay a 7% or an 8% pref. Class A might pay a, this 10% pref. But what I've done is, is I've crowded enough people together to get to the minimum investment for a class A share versus if you just took their hundred thousand dollars they could go buy a class b share they'd be at a lower return i'm sure everybody is super confused now right no i have a question casey yeah. so yes. your sponsor what percentage of the deal are they getting up front and what percentage are the invest like i know what you're doing with your investors but you're doing a little differently than i've seen done but i mean um like what percentage are you giving your sponsor basically up front? Like a, a 20%, a 10% of the deal? What are you? Well, now in- Because they're just, the, was, they're, they're the face of it, basically. They're the ones that are gonna get the deal done for you. And, and I'll answer that. Every deal is different. I, I've yeah. yet to see any of these. So it's, so that's not really, that's kind of like saying, what commission do you charge to sell a house? You know? Um, yeah. Okay. Every so deal is deal to deal is, is kind of correct. a different thing. Unless you're going into, unless you're going into a fund itself, um, then, yeah, then you can, well, then even that's negotiable on a deal by deal scenario. And, and that's another question I was actually going to ask is, do you ever work with private equity funds versus taking you know your llc or maybe not your llc your partnership or whatever um and going in and directly own it do you do you yes and no yes and and that's that's actually so when you're doing these deals so there's there's a couple of different ways and I, again we could talk about maybe more about this offline or, or, or just amongst you and I. Um, but one thing that you have to be careful of is when you're, when you're reinvesting funds like this, some deals in funds like what you're talking about don't like to start paying that pref until the capital is actually deployed. Some funds will actually start paying the pref as soon as they get the money. And yeah. so you have to be, so that again, that kind of comes, that's why things are such a deal by deal on a deal by deal scenario because you don't you you don't want to be committed one way and then have something step in and be another like i don't want to be committed to paying my investors a, an eight percent pref if i take the money and then turn around and deploy it and that guy says oh hey by the way we're not paying until we deploy the capital ourselves and then you're like um what <laughs> so then you're stuck paying eight percent on money that's sitting there doing nothing does that make mm -hmm. sense yeah yeah i just 
I, I guess I think I did I answer that right or I, I'm sorry if I didn't I'm trying to yeah yeah no you did you did I mean it's just for I mean for you every deal every deal is different um I know for some people who do syndications they a lot of their deals are are like cookie cutter almost yeah yeah they definitely can be um yeah. man Gary I'm just scrolling through here you got a ton of people on here dude what in the world yeah. I, we, we we fill the house every week I like that and, Yep. I like that, and, man. If I, I would have been way more nervous if I knew we had that many people on there. <laughs> That's what you're doing great. Hey, uh, talk a little bit about, explain what you mean about the fund of funds. Because I know most most uh, times when we're raising funds, we have, it's like it's either project specific. Hey, we got this project. We're going we're gonna to buy this old rundown 40 in a building. We're going to gut it, remodel it, put it back on the market, run it out for twice what it's running for now. And you can be part of this deal to kick in you know, hundred thousand dollars to ten percent, versus raising money. Hey, we're raising money because we're going to go out and we're going to find the good deals, um, and uh, you know, buy portfolios and things like that. I've, I've I've been part of one of those before. We actually created a an actual mutual closed end mutual fund is what we did. It was kind of a big deal, but and this is this is a lot the same okay. kind of a deal. Um, so. I'm of the opinion that Warren Buffett doesn't wait until he needs capital to raise it. Um, I don't think that's ever been the case. And I don't think any, and again, because we're all, everybody that's in the real estate business, as far as, as far as we're all concerned from the, the agent standpoint, um, when you're, you, we all know that you get the best deals when there's no financing involved, there's no contingencies involved. And it's, and when I say both of those, I'm talking about basically talking about purely financing contingencies. And when there's no financing contingencies involved, life is much, much easier and you get a better deal. You call a guy up and say, Hey man, I'll give you X dollars for that place right there. Cash money we will close in a week. Let me do my due diligence. You know, if it's a smaller deal, obviously you don't want to do that when you've got, when you've got a, a, a 200 unit complex, that's got, you know, that's got crisscrossing sewers underneath and stuff like that. So I don't want to sound like we're being reckless, but we all know that the person with the money in their pocket wins, gets the cheese most of the time. And so that's part of the reason why these funds, especially here recently have been so popular because these guys are like, Hey, we're going to get the better deals. We're going to get the better returns, which is going to be more money in your pocket at the end. If, you invest now but from a fundraising standpoint going and trying to sell an investor on investing a hundred thousand dollars with you and you say hey well we really don't have anything right now that money's just going to chill for a little while that's pretty tough that's like that's like trying to push a boulder up a hill you know what i'm saying and so there there's there's six of one, you know, it's kind of six of one half dozen of the other, depending on what you specialize in. But when I go and I say, hey, I have vetted these operators. These operators have been through a process. You know, I've known them for a long time. They're all very well connected. They're all very well um, um, experienced. They've done this. They've had tons of exits. Uh, they've had tons of profitable exits at that. And then I go to them and say, hey, you know, I go to the investors and say, we've got three operators that we invest with. They invest in these asset classes, which my fund, my specific asset classes are self-storage, mobile home parks, and multifamily real estate. Those are the three asset classes that I know best. And in order for me to, 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 to take my investor's money and put it into something, it has to be an asset class that I know. Because then I know what to look for when, when it comes down to it. So when we start saying, okay, then they have, then they they invest across whatever geographies each one of them invests in. Can 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 I ask you a question, Casey? Um, can we talk a little bit about yes. your strategy? Sorry. Somebody was beeping in. Can, can I ask, for, yeah, your strategy for acquisition of these investors? 
strategy for acquisition of these investors really is is so 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 my main strategy and i'll tell you what my main strategy is is encompassed by is is a podcast um i know that that so you're talking about on the investor side right like like to have an investor come to me and say hey here's my money will you go invest it yeah, basically, yeah. That's you know, what you're asking, you right? have to have people to present to. Okay, that's what I thought. Present your opportunities to, right? So, yeah. Correct. Yeah, and my so my 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 biggest my my uh, my main channel right now or way of of getting people to come aboard is obviously doing things like this and um, and doing a podcast. My podcast, which is where Gary and I met is really kind of my bread and butter as far as that goes, because I get to bring people like, so could you imagine, let's all, let's everybody look at Gary's screen right there. Look at, check him out, wave to us, Gary. There is exactly, there is hundreds and probably even into the thousands of people just like Gary, who all are out there wanting their chance to tell their story. So we're doing these podcasts and not only are these folks coming back to me saying, man, I love these points you brought up. They're also going to the people like Gary and saying, man, I really like these points you brought up. So when, when we're out looking for investors, we are, we're using, again, we're building a community. See, if you'll notice, that's much like my real estate business, my local real estate business that I was talking about, we're building a community. This is just a different channel. Uh, so I guess that's, the, if I, I'm answering that correctly, when we present our opportunities, those are investors that have came to our website from listening to us on a podcast or listening to a guest on a podcast. And I don't know that I've ever been in a, in a business and I've been in a few, not, not a over overly ton of them, but I don't know that I've ever seen a more giving bunch of people than I have in this, in this whole syndication real estate business side of things, because it's like, man, we're all like sitting here waiting to know what we can do to help somebody else. And that's just like Gary having me in his class. I mean, it'd have been easy for him to say, hey, man, tell me all you know. Now. Let me go back to my group and tell them and act like I know what you know. And, and, and instead, he's like, hey, dude, come on my class here. Let's talk. Let's, let's teach these folks about this, this, and this. And, it's, and, and so we're all there to kind of help one another. And everybody's branded just like you see Gary there with his brand behind him. You know, if, 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 if he's on my podcast and my YouTube channel, that's what shows up. And so we're, we're, we're out there actively looking for people who are, who are, who are wanting to not only learn, but then come in and, and say, Hey, you know, we're, we're trusting you with, with this, with our money. And, and, and we, have, again, we have a process that we've vetted these operators with, so we hope that at some point people feel comfortable enough to ask the questions and make sure that we're answering what they need to be answered. Uh, Casey, uh, can I ask yes. you uh, a rookie question? Uh, yeah, a rookie what, question. What determines your time frame for the, the deal structures? Uh, is it the Sorry, size I'm, of the deal, uh, the number of partners that you're looking for? Uh, and like, when do you start doing the payoffs and when do you start the building process? You know, like... A, I guess if you could uh, give me a quick uh, walk through uh, through a scenario. Okay, you know, so let's, some, let's something just, like a summary. Let's okay, let's talk about like a one-off syndication, right? Now, okay, this thank is you. this this is the is that, is that kind of, am I kind of getting there? Is that what I, I didn't see who that was, Gary? Who was that that asked? Yes, PF Jimenez. We call him Mister Cool. Okay, now are we are we sure that's <laughs> Jimenez? Well, it's Jimenez. Okay. It's actually Jimenez. No, okay. Well, that's that was my that was my question. I like I said, yeah. I was just curious. <laughs> but all right, Mr. Cool. All right, so so Mr. Cool. So we're going to talk about a. Well, I'll, I'll Thank say you. A, like a one-off syndication, and I'll tell you. So so it's kind of the old what came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Um, and when you start thinking about this, it's like okay, so if you go out and raise capital and you don't have a deal right? What do you do? You have all this capital raised, you have no deal. All right. You go out and you put a contract on a piece of property for a $10 million apartment complex and you have no capital. Now what happens if you can't raise the capital, right? So you, it's the chicken or the egg. What came first, the contract on the property or the capital raising? And that is where, that is where we have to, 
I guess, make water run a little bit uphill, if you will, by saying, okay, you step as close into a deal as you possibly can. You also get investors on the phone and, with, and, and get them as close as, they, as you possibly can. And then all of a sudden, one day you wake up and boom, you try to pull them all together and get everything done. Now, so the first thing that you're going to do is, is you're going to have a list. Uh, you hear everybody from Russell Brunson all the way through to Grant Cardone. Everybody talks about the list, your list, your list of whoever's, right? So you have a list and you go out to them and you say, hey, guys, listen, I have the ends on a deal over here and I'm going to have to raise $2 million. Who's, who would be in if I had to raise? Now, if you're Grant Cardone or somebody, you just go do the deal, then raise the money. And if you don't raise the money, you go get financing elsewhere and you take care of it like that, right? You and I, if I have to come up with $2 million, I have to get out and do something about it. So you call your investors, you say, hey, I've got the ends on a deal that looks like these could be the pro forma numbers. And this is what it's going to look like. Would you hypothetically, if I had this deal in my hand today, would you be interested in investing, right? If you need to raise $2 million in that part of the process, you raise $4 million. You raise twice what you need in what we call the soft commitment phase. Now you have that kind of money. You have an idea that you have this many people that are interested in investing. So now you go back to your broker and you say, okay, um, I'm ready to, to submit. And, and again, some of this stuff, you can do it over a week's time. You can do it over 10 days time, however much time or whatever timeline you have to work with based on your broker, that's what you need to do. All right, so then you go back and you submit what's called a letter of intent, which we all should all know what that is. Um, and your LOI says, hey, I'll pay this. Um, we'll try to close on this day. I've got this long for due diligence and so on. And then once your LOI is accepted, then you can really start securing some hard commitments from your investors. You can say, hey, guys, uh, we're, we're, we got this deal under contract now. Um, just know that, and you can do this one of two ways. You can either do what we call capital calls, which are, hey, I need the money by the 10th. Uh, I would rather have it by the 8th, but I need it by the 10th. You must wire it over, blah, blah, blah. Or you can say, hey, we'll start paying the PREF, the preferred return, uh, say two weeks after you close to give you a little buffer room um, and go ahead and have them wire money over. Uh, that's why I like the fund model a little bit better there. But as you can tell, you're trying to you're trying to find a way to make everything meet, if you will. Yep, um, that's cool. And kind of like, uh, how, when do you start paying uh, back the investors? Like, uh, how far into the project do you start the payment? Process? Well, now I think I think I think. Uh, now, I don't know anything about new development stuff, so I want to I want to make sure that, that we're on the same page there when we're talking projects. Um, I don't I don't do new development. I actually despise anything building wise from for many different reasons. It's just it's just my preference. But um, when, for instance, like our fund of funds, um, we start paying our preferred return. Uh, the first day of the following month after the investment, most of the time, wow. if you've got, if, soon. if you've got, if you've got, well, now that's our fund of funds, but see, I'm in with operators where we're going to get the pref immediately upon disbursement of the capital. So it's then on our operators to make sure that they place the capital in the hard asset and get it rolling. So it takes the burden off of us and puts the burden elsewhere, but most of the deals that I'm involved in are uh, cash flowing assets from the beginning. You know, you might have some repositioning and some, a couple like, you know, you might have 60 or 90 days, but there again, that needs to be, when you're presenting to your investors, that needs to be presented. You need to say, hey, listen, we're going to close on this deal. It's going to be a minimum of 90 days before you get a disbursement because we're going to be doing this list of things here and, re and working towards a reposition of the asset. You, you don't want to take on your investor's money under the idea that they're going to start getting the return immediately. And then all of a sudden you're 90 or 120 days into it and everybody's going, where's our money? Where's our money? And you're like, oh, shoot, I forgot to tell you 
that we were going to be repositioning the asset. So again, that's all the stuff that you have to just be like disclosed, transparent, transparent, disclose. I mean, like that needs, that's what I think about every single day when I get out of bed, transparency and disclosure, transparency and disclosure. And, and a lot of times people are just like you all and everybody's your damn friend until money becomes involved. Once money mm-hmm. becomes involved, then everybody is kind of your friend. They're not really your friend. Yeah. They're not really not your friend, but they're just kind of like, and that's why I don't like, personally, I don't like a 506B because I love my family for one. And number two, I love Thanksgiving dinner. As you can tell, Thanksgiving <laughs> dinner is my favorite meal of the year. And Me I don't want to go to thanks. <laughs> I don't want to go to Thanksgiving dinner and have to tell all these people where their damn money's at and, and why we missed why last month's return wasn't quite as good as the month before. You know, I don't want to do that. I want to go out and raise money from accredited investors, people that are affluent in the, the people that are, that are affluent in business in general. And that's the way I look at it. Now, one part of a 506 B that I must point out now, there's a term that's sophisticated investor, which is which is once which is one tier under accredited investor. Sophisticated investor basically just means, hey, I'm not living under a rock. I know that this that this money could potentially be lost if, if all else fails. And 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 so that there is there is a, a certain I think what they do for the I think the reason they do that is just to protect some of our protected classes, like 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 maybe people who are who are um, mentally challenged and things like that. They don't want you, they don't want somebody like going out there and talking them out of their $200,000 to invest in a deal. And they didn't have a clue. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, thank you very much was, for that. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Uh, um, I'll, I'll tell you one thing too, guys, I want to um, interject here. So when I've, when I've been involved with these in the past, we were talking about the chicken and the egg and it really is. It's, it's like, what do you do? Do you find the properties and then you find the investors or do you find the investors and then find the properties? And when you're first starting out, if you want to have more success attracting the money, you've got to demonstrate that you have success identifying the good deals, right? That's it's, it's the old money follows management. So in the beginning showing a track record is going to help you an awful lot. And all you need is a few people. You don't need a hundred people. Honestly, I mean, I've oh, seen yeah. Yeah, two or three people sometimes is all you need. Sometimes two people. But now, what a lot of people too, Gary, yeah. don't know is you can use like your four hundred one k or your you yeah. know a lot of people, uh, the money managers in this world, like people don't know that they can use their own money to go do what they want to go do with it. Mm-hmm. It's a it's obnoxious. The, the these money managers like make people think that. They can't call them and be like, "Hey, I want to go buy. I want to go invest in this deal," because yeah. you're just buying stock in an LLC versus buying stock in Coke. Or you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's the same difference. Yeah. Yep. So you know, you, you know what's interesting is, um, okay, so everybody here has heard of hard money lenders. You know what hard money lenders are, right? They're not. They're not banks. They're private citizens, and they'll lend you money privately. They fall within the the genre of private money. Some private money is just, you know, they're just, they're not hard money. They're like, they're looking for a decent return. They want low risk and high, high returns. Did you know that a lot of hard money lenders, a lot of private lenders, they're not actually sitting there with millions of dollars in the bank. They're actually pulling out a, a line of credit against their existing holdings, either their investment properties, sometimes their own homes. Okay. It, it three or 4%, they're borrowing at three or 4% and lending out at 10 and 12% or sometimes 15%. That's what they're doing. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the people you're going to be dealing with, the, the money you're attracting, often it's not like it's just cash sitting there. It's a business line of credit they have with available funds on it to draw against. That's often what you're going to have. And they're willing to take that risk. They're willing to, to, to risk, you know, three and a half percent interest payment, knowing that they may get a 10% return. And sometimes we and it's secured on the house too, secured on the property. And there's a lot of guys, there's a lot of capital raisers that are in the hard money lending business where they've got a line of people that are saying, Hey man, I'm in for a million. 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 And all they do is call them up and say, Hey, I got a guy over here. It's got a house in Clarksville, Tennessee. He wants to, he wants to borrow 80% on it. And they're like, Hey, let's go. 
Yep. So what happens is, generally speaking, when you start off, you start off small. It just, you know, maybe you can get a 10 unit building or something and get it under contract and have two people fund it, you know. Um, that's just how you get started. Later on, you transition from finding the deals and then you can track the, 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 the investors to, like Casey was mentioned earlier, you know, build up that you always want to be raising capital so that when you find a deal, you can strike. You can strike fast, especially in a market the way it's been lately. So it's really, it's really a transition. I mean, for me, I just got lucky because we were doing so many transactions. The market tanked. The stock market tanked. And Wall Street people were, were leaving Wall Street. You, that, you know what's bad when Wall Street people <laughs> are investing in their own stuff. And they're calling me, literally calling me, saying, we, we'd like to deploy $100 million in Pittsburgh. We understand you're the guy that does all the investment deals. And, and I'm like, I never did anything close to that in my life. And I... I think you know, I said I don't think you can you can invest hundred million dollars in this, this town. And uh, you know, and at one time this guy said, "Look, I'm going to show you how we're going to do it. I'm going to give you the biggest education of your life. I know I can trust you. I just want the right guy." And I said, "Okay, fair enough." And one of the, the most important lessons I ever learned in my life. I learned I got more out of that than I got out of four years in college. Okay, and I could have retired off of that one deal. I got property manager contracts. All I did is had to find portfolios. And I actually did that first. I said, well, I called the guy back. I said, I've actually got two portfolios. Are you guys ready? So we got to do the entire, we got to submit the package, the, S the SEC. And it was an attorney involved, SEC attorney. It was kind of a big deal. And um, I got all the commissions from, from acquiring the, the portfolios. I got the property management commissions for, uh, payment for managing them. I got more commissions because we sold off some of the assets. And later on, I got more because we even fixed up more properties and sold them at higher higher prices and just an amazing thing. But most people start off small. I mean, would you agree, Casey? You, you don't start off with a hundred million. You start off with maybe a million, you know? Yeah, it's like anything else. I mean, you, it's just like any of your real estate businesses. I mean, you know, you have to get that first listing. Once you, once I got my first listing, it was like everything else was like, like all of a sudden the pressure I was putting on myself evaporated. And so it's the same type of deal, but then you get your second listing and you get your third. It's like you're, you know, you start off and you start into a deal. Now I am actually, I know it sounds crazy, um, but we're actually looking at some, some properties here in Kentucky and I'm a licensed Kentucky agent. We're looking at some in Tennessee. I'm a licensed Tennessee agent. And what I'm going to do is if, of course, something comes to fruition on them, I am actually going to either take a reduction of what my commission would be off. Just to me, I get really when I when I talk about disclose transparency, disclose transparency, disclose transparency. I don't want it to ever seem like I'm churning a deal in order to turn my own commissions. So I'm going to get the commission for my investors, but it's going to be to buy a reduction of the sales price by what I otherwise would get or a reinvestment in with my, not an investment of my own money, but a reduction of what my investors need to bring to the table, I guess is what I mean. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just, it's a matter, it's, 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 you know, I learned something in this, in this, when I first started learning this business and it's, it's an alignment of, of interests and, and if you're brokering on one of those deals and I mean, yeah, it's, it's really, uh, uh, but there, there's so many different ways to go about it. Yeah. So, yep. and a couple of things, guys, I'm going to kind of paint a picture for us. So this all kind of start making sense here. Um, first thing I'm going to admit a, mis a mistake. When I did that project, I told you about, I was offered a partnership in it. I was offered a, a basically an, an equity share in the, in the entire fund, the project. And I turned it down because my, my, my upbringing in real estate was don't partner with clients because you're licensed and they're not. And if something goes wrong, yeah. you go to litigation, they're going to, you're automatically going to lose. But what I found out later on is the same broker told me, I said, well, Gary, that's with the small stuff. So when it comes to the big, the big projects, you should have said yes. He told I'd said, well, I should have known that two years ago. So what I'm getting at guys is this is an opportunity for you to participate in investing Right, you 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 give up your six percent commission for maybe six or ten percent share in the project. 
That's one thing. Another thing is this, you know, K Casey's one of us. He, he is. I don't mean just an investor agent. He's, for, for those of you not in the XP, please forgive me. But I, bit, I found out at the end of the podcast, that actually not even then, I, I wanted to call Casey up to talk about teaching class here. Turns out he's also a EXP. And, uh, but what I'm getting at is, let's say you're in, you're in St. Louis or you're in, you know, wherever, you, you know, Nashville. And you find a really good deal. You're like, man, I wish I knew somebody who could buy this. Call Casey. He may have some investors that say, look, send me, send me the numbers. This is how this works. Send me the numbers. Send me the p &L, right, for three years. Yep. They'll look at it and they'll make quick decisions, right, Casey? And then you guys may have yourself a commission, you know? Yeah, if you have investor, yeah, if you have investment properties, by all means, and and I'll tell you now, now guys, I, I can't stress this enough. This is all stuff like I learned after being in the real estate business for thirteen or fourteen years, and and you know I was in it and I was in it on such a transactional level that as soon as the transactional level kind of dissipated, even just the slightest little bit, I was I was out, and I will tell you, Gary, you hit on something there just a minute ago. I, I, it's easy for me to sit here and say, you have to change your way of thinking. You have to change your way of thinking. You have to increase your way of thinking. And that, that's so much harder. I know than it, than it said than done. And I know that that's like, what do you mean it's harder? I'm just saying it, it was so difficult for me to pass up a $200,000 sale because I was off looking at a 10 or $15 million apartment building. And at first I was like, well, I got to stay here because this is the guaranteed money. This is the six, this is the 3% or 6% commission on a $200,000 sale. But I was like, you know, we're, we're either going to keep doing that or we're going to go and we're going to, we're going to get into something that that's like, like, cause I kept hearing it. I heard it through my, my whole career. They'd say more millionaires and billionaires are made in real estate than anything. And, you know, and I'll be honest, I made almost $400,000 in commission last year. Okay. And as wonderful as that sounds, and as great as that sounds, I know that I can't keep up at a rate like that. I can't do that forever. Mm -hmm. So, and at the same time, I'm like, wow, that's great money. That's far from billionaire or millionaire. Like how many of those years do you have to have to be a millionaire or billionaire? And so when I started investigating all this stuff a couple of years ago and it just all started making perfect sense, I'm like, that's how they make it. That's how they get recurring income. That's where the cash flow comes from, which Gary, I was the last thing I'm yep. going to let, I'll let y'all go. My podcast I mentioned earlier, which is where Gary and I met a couple of weeks ago. Um, I would encourage everybody to check that out. You don't have to check it out because I want you to come invest with us. You don't have to check it out because I want you to do to take any other action other than to educate yourself um, and 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 learn from the very best in the business. Everything from accounting all the way through to real estate agents uh, and, and basically everything in between. So um, check that out. Yep, I'll give him another reason to listen to podcasts. Guys, guess who Casey's guest is tomorrow on his podcast. <laughs> my guy right there there That's he it. is and check it out he's on youtube channel he's we're at a youtube channel but it's cash flow cash flow pro um cash flow pro. and uh or you can and you can also we've got two separate websites if you want to learn more about the syndication business uh gary i don't want am i allowed to tell to to yeah. say where they can go okay i don't want to Absolutely. By all means, go to Gary first. I don't. I, I'm not. I'm not trying to pitch myself because, like I said, we're we're rocking and rolling. We just want to bring as many people and educate as many people as we can. But um, if you want to learn, listen to the podcast or go to the podcast website and just scroll through the episodes and learn, it's cashflow.pro. www.cashflow.pro. No dot com. So nothing. Just dot pro. And then just to learn more about the syndication business in general and get definitions and a list of basically everything that you could possibly need you can just go to uh, 303000 capital.com and yep. uh hit us up i mean you can always send us messages and gary will get in touch with me i can get in touch with gary it's uh or like i said this i've never i've never seen an industry that's more giving than this whole mm -hmm. like this whole real estate syndication whole real estate business world so yeah 
Well, I tell you what, guys, I, uh, I'm also in a few more minutes, but I just realized I want to recognize a couple couple of new agents, uh, Thomas Roscoe and and where's Chad? Chad Raglan. I didn't realize you were you were in. Congre Welcome aboard, guys. Congratulations too. And and if there's anybody else, guys, please let me know. I see some guests. Um, Sally Key, Sarah Black. Let's see. Armand's back on. Armand, good to see you, man. Mark Phillips, good to see you. Let's see. And some agents I haven't seen for Les Leslie Perez, all the way from Houston. I haven't seen you in a, we used to say, I haven't seen you in a coon's age. That's that's old Virginia mountain talk. <laughs> but it's good to see you, Leslie. Um, let's see. Who else? Any other guests? Uh, Greg Covington, good to see you, man. Hot dog. Um, okay. Uh, I tell you what, guys, let's do a quick round here. Does this, what Casey was talking about, like not necessarily changing your way of thinking. I want to touch on this. It's expanding your thinking, right? This is your continual, just, just treat life as if life, it's a big giant classroom. And your, your only purpose is to, to learn as much as you can learn while you're here and learn as, as fast as you can learn. And one of the things you'll learn is if you're thinking about this, or you're being real cerebral about it. What these guys are doing has to do with velocity of money. So it's one thing to put money in a CD and earn 1% for a year. That's, that's kind of pathetic. But that's a linear approach to investing. When you can increase the velocity of your money. So when somebody's doing a, a, a capital raise, they might be making 10% on an on a interest, interest rate, 10% return on the, on the loan. They're making a loan. They could also be an equity partner. So they have a share in the actual ownership of whatever they're buying. And they could also be a profit share partner. So if they profit in the case of an income producing property like a rental or a sale of a flip, they also get share of profit. You can have somebody be one or, one or two or all three of those categories at the same time. They can be just a, lo a lender earning 10%. They'd be a, a lender plus a profit share partner or a lender plus a equity share partner, right? So you can skin that cat a number of different ways, but what they're doing is they're redeploying their money, right? As many ways as they can. So they may own another asset, or get a business line of credit to get that asset, lend that money to this project where they're making a more return on that money. And yet their, their asset they borrowed against to begin with is still making money. So now they're using one asset to make money two different ways. And if they also lend out that line of credit somewhere else, they're making a third stream of income off one asset. Does this make sense, guys? Velocity, velocity of money, uh, Gary. That's that's a really good way to put it. And yep. and I will too encourage any agents out there. I mean, it's going to behoove you to learn this stuff if you ever want to. Because I used to think that, like, I used to have a dream of making a hundred thousand dollar commission check at one hit until I did it, and then it wasn't a dream anymore. And you know, and that's real money. That's real time. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's like pre-tax, you know, that that's taxable income money. And that was way back in my agent, you know, a few years back in my agent years when I did that. But it, at the same time, you know, I was just like, and, and again, that those buyers are out there. You just have to go find them. And they're, you know, you're not going to do one every day, but hell, all you do is two or three of those a year and you're in business. <laughs> yep. And I'll, and I'll take it back full circle. At the very beginning, what did what did I ask Casey to actually talk about? Not not the raising capital. What did I ask take it to Casey to talk about in the very beginning? Forming a community. It's the investor clubs, guys. I'm telling you, I I I think we're going to go at it again this fall. But this time we'll do live events for those who are interested. I know the first time around we we got beat up pretty good trying to do it online. We had some success. Um, but live in person is always better than, than being on, on a Zoom. Um, build a community because those people, some of them are just looking to deploy some, they're looking to borrow against their existing portfolio and lend it somewhere else. They'd rather you do the work and let them sit back and collect a, a, a fee. And you can absolutely do it. And it's separate and unique from your commission income. You still earn commission income too. Yes, you can trade it to be a partner. But what I'm getting at is you're already in the business. You're now leveraging your activities to generate another stream of income. And everybody should have at least one other business, right? That's, that's my philosophy. So um, keep your eyes and ears open. Uh, we got a, 
we got a big book project right now we're working on. Um, but I think in the fall when that thing's uh, completed, we're going to move back into forming our investor groups again because the, 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 the economy is already changing. You, have you guys seen the stock market Friday and today? It's, it's a bloodbath. Collectively, if you take the Dow, the SP 500, right, and the NASDAQ and add up the percentage losses, it's 69% now for the year. Divided by three, that's 23%. 23% is a full blown bear market. Okay. Two of the indexes are already there individually on their own. One of them is already like 30%. That's the NASDAQ. This is real and it's happening right in front of us. And yet the, the politicians, and I'm not, you know, I don't even care what, what, where they're from, what part they're from. The Secretary of the Treasury literally stood up there and said, we're not in a recession. The economy is very strong. That's what she was saying. In the meantime, across the bottom of the screen shows the Dow down a thousand points. And she's literally, <laughs> it's just insanity. So, you know, block all the nonsense out, focus on the facts. And the facts tell us we need to prepare. And, and I've, you know, the time is, the time's not tomorrow. Time is now. Be prepared now, be ahead of the curve. Okay. So everybody's starting to get the, the, the my preaching on this. Yep, I, I tell you, it's going to be investors and new construction. New construction is hard, but I tell you that, that if you look at any recession, and we're just getting into it. Who knows? It could be 18 months, could be another five years. I don't know. Um, but the point is, is real estate got us in the last recession. That's really not what's happening right now. Real estate's just going to be the bubble that burst. But it's going to come out. It's going to bring us out of the recession, too, because every time you build something new, you involve all the trades, you involve all that material, the appliances, everything, carpenters, all the services, lenders, insurance, attorneys. Everybody benefits when you build a house. I think it's gonna be affordable housing. That's what I believe. I could be completely wrong, but I think that's what it's gonna be. And investors are always, always, always there every single recession in droves. People coming out of the woodwork. Their uncles are investors. Their grandmothers are investors. Everybody's an investor. And now is the time to build the community and build those relationships. Um, any case, I know where it's about 8.30, guys. Any, any final thoughts or questions? Anybody feeling the juice? I'm feeling it. I'm going shopping, guys. I'm telling you. I'm getting the urge. I'm going shopping. You know, I can't wait. So, okay. Let's check the question box one more time here. Uh, I'd love to attend that. Um, yeah, there it is, guys. Uh, uh, Cashflow Pro and 3000 Capital. Thank you, Tom. Oh, by the way, next week, uh, so Tom is going to host the Class Force guys next Monday Night Live because I'll, I'll, Gene and I, Lisa, several of us will be down at um, Orlando for the Shareholder Summit. And we've got uh, Michael O'Keefe is going to help come on and talk about his phone calling. He's a phone call guy, he doesn't send stuff in the mail, he's a phone call guy. Um, Targan's going to come on and talk about her Facebook uh, um, new construction campaign. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else did I have here. Um, had this all Didn't, Mo. Didn't you have Mo? Mo. Uh, Mo Dupe, yep, the booklet. Thank you very much. And it seems like there's one more person. Oh, Betty. Betty in the letter. Yep, so that's four people. Tom, I don't think you're going to get through all four of them, but, you know, uh, I think that's going to be a really good class. Anybody who's not going to be at the summit, definitely tune in because these are the campaigns that are working the best right now. It doesn't matter where you are, who you are, what state you're in, what company you're with, whether you work with investors or not. These are things that work for general consumers too. That's what's going to happen next Monday night. So make sure you're there and, uh, and uh, give, give Tom a big, and Tom, thank you very much for doing that, by the way. I really appreciate you stepping up to the plate, you know? I got uh, volunteered for it. So. Well, that's true. Pep, yeah, Beverly. <laughs> Beverly's so smart. She just <laughs> somehow or other presents things. It's just like, okay, I guess I'm doing it. You know? <laughs> so my pleasure. Yep. Yeah, another another fellow Virginian and and uh, pretty neat stuff. So okay, guys, uh, if there's no more questions, I'll I'll go ahead and uh, consider this one a wrap. And thanks again to all the guests, um, and also the the new agents on the team. Um, and the agents I haven't seen for a while. God bless you guys. God bless your families. And uh, if you're traveling, stay safe. And I will see you the following Monday, I guess, the 27th. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be Thanks, Casey. Out. Thanks, Gary. Yes, you're welcome. Hey.
Hey, hey, see you all. Can, can we give Casey a, a pat on the back too? Oh, we think you just trying to just let off. Okay. There is Casey. Yeah. So thanks again. Yes, Casey. thank you all. I'll see yep, you tomorrow. Be man. safe. Uh, okay. Well. Bye, everyone. Bye.